now we're looking at the uh, cell signaling stuff. So uh, there's a few different things going on with cell signaling. Uh, looking here is, is just kind of the idea of like, well, how would, if you have two cells that are literally right next to each other, how might they be able to communicate? And, and there's some, you know, they, they can send, these cells could send signals to one another, like that will happen. You know, we're going over like localized signaling and stuff, but like if they're literally right next to each other, they also can communicate with um, these like openings where they share cytoplasm. It's kind of the key word here. So gap junctions, animal cells are sharing their cytoplasm with one another. And these are um, small molecules, um, a lot of times ions, uh, things that can like fit through pretty small, they're not like these giant holes. Um, and then in plants, it's called plasmodesmata. So just know, you know, those kind of buzzwordy names and stuff, okay? Uh, and then um, there's two general categories of, uh, when we talk about signaling, there's local signaling. So the gap junctions, plasma, does mod, that would obviously fall into the realm of local signaling because they're right next to each other. There's two other kinds of local signaling I wanna make note of. The first would be paracrine signaling. Um, so paracrine is like the cells are right next to each other and they're sending signaling molecules. So this could be some sort of local regulator. So maybe some sort of like, this could be like a growth factor that would like signal to the cells, hey, we need to grow. Or hey, we need to make more of this certain hormone. That, you know, maybe if it's like a, some sort of like gland or something that secretes a lot of hormones, this could be like telling them, the cells to like, hey, we need to make more of this hormone or something. Whatever it might be, it's local. Um, the second kind is synaptic signaling. And this is only for your nerve cells. So in nerve cells, this would be the end of one neuron. So this is the, called the axon. And then the dendrite is the receiving end of the second neuron. And they'll send a neurotransmitter as like the specific name for the messenger when it's two nerve cells communicating. And then um, they'll diffuse across the synapse and then they'll bind to, um, uh, we'll get more into these, but like, you know, there's all these protein receptors all along the membrane that are specific, that specifically accept a certain kind of signaling molecule, okay? Um, so there you go, oh, and this target cell could also be a muscle cell. It doesn't have to be another nerve cell. This could be like, um, they call it the neuromuscular <clears throat> junction. That's where like the nerve cell and the muscle cell kind of meet up. So if you want to like flex a certain muscle, this nerve cell would send um, uh, acetylcholine as like the main neurotransmitter that's used in like muscle signaling that would then bind to the muscle cell and tell the muscle cell contract. So there you go. So then the opposite of local would be long distance. So um, there's really only one kind of long distance signaling and that is hormonal signaling. So uh, in hormonal signaling, you would have um, a cell they call an endocrine cell. So endocrine cells release hormones. So uh, right, endocrinologist, you go to an endocrinologist, you're having trouble uh, producing certain hormones. Now, how hormones uh, travel long distances is through the bloodstream, right? All of your cells are connected to like, all of your cells are only a very, very short distance away from your bloodstream, from some sort of um, capillaries at the very ending of your blood vessels. So hormones will travel all the way through the bloodstream to all of your cells, but, and this is an important detail, only the cells that have that specific receptor to bind that hormone will respond to it. Okay, so in long distance, because it's going through the bloodstream, all of your cells technically receive, the, they give it like radios. You know, radios, all of like, all like radios are receiving, uh, have the ability to receive like a, like a radio transmission, but only um, radios that have set their receptor, the receptor, the, yeah, I don't know what radius, but like whatever the receiving part of radio is, uh, uh, to that right frequency, that would, uh, what is it? The antenna, was it? Yeah. Uh, it? It doesn't matter. That they, they set it to the right, they, they can bind that, that message properly, will respond to it. So, there you go. Uh, all right, signal, uh, there's three like parts of every cell signaling that you need to know. The first is reception. And, th and then these follow very kind of common sense, right? You gotta be able to receive, you know, got the radio's gotta be set to the right uh, dial or whatever. Uh, know this buzzword, know that a signaling molecule is a ligand, okay? Ligand is the name for whatever the signaling molecule is. And the receptor is specific to a ligand, okay? There, it, like there's 
one receptor for one ligand, just like you have one key for one lock, generally speaking. And then once you have reception happening, this is important, you get a change in conformation, a change in shape of that receptor protein, change in shape, and that leads to a signal transduction pathway. The purpose of the signal transduction pathway is amplification. Amplification and transmission. Um, amplification doesn't really happen quite as much if it's like intracellular signaling, which I'll, I'll show you in a couple slides. But if it's um, signaling where it's binding to a membrane receptor, that's where you'll get the amplification with the, the second messengers and the kinases and all of that. And the ultimately, we're trying to lead to some sort of response. So the responses I want you to think about is um, uh, it could be like uh, activating enzymes. And enzymes will like lead to chemical reactions. So we're trying to activate certain enzymes to do certain chemical reactions more. Or uh, gene expression, meaning we want to turn on certain genes or more rarely turn off genes. But usually, you're trying to turn on a certain gene. You want to, genes make proteins, so you're trying to turn on certain pro, uh, genes to make certain proteins to respond to that message. Okay. All right, uh, looking at some of the different types of um, uh, signaling. So this is a G protein coupled receptor, GPCR. And the name sounds kind of intimidating, but just break it down and it really can make some sense here. So G, is referring to the G protein. Um, the P is to so G protein coupled. The, who is the couple, right? The couple is the receptor and the G protein. They're in a relationship, okay? They're in a committed relationship here, right? And um, they, well, really, you know, what happens is when the signaling molecule binds, this G protein will actually get activated and it's going to leave its receptor, um, it's kind of sad. Uh, so, you know, say, I guess what's happening, if we're being honest, is like this receptor found, a, found someone better, this ligand that they like better. <laughs> and this G protein is like, well, you know, I deserve better. This G protein deserves better. And it's moving across <laughs> to this enzyme. So in the, the membrane, you would have another kind of protein that's an enzyme. And this enzyme becomes activated when the G protein binds to it. And then this will lead to your cellular response. So um, I'll show you like later on a lot of what can happen here. Like this arrow, a lot of what you would see then would be your second messengers. So it would be like your um, cyclic AMP or calcium. Why did I do calcium with another capital A? Calcium. And then the second messengers would lead to um, uh, the phosphorylation cascade. Phosphorylation cascade. And those two things would fall under signal transduction. So those would both be part of the signal transduction, the second part of a uh, cell signaling. So the first part would be your reception, and then this arrow here, what I'm trying to get at is they're leaving out a lot of details here that I'll, I will show you on the next slide, but keep that in mind. There's a lot of other, the cellular response could be, that's your third step, or this would be number two, cellular response is number three, but keep in mind that they're leaving out a lot of details before you get to that cellular response. Uh, all right, so then the other kind of um, uh, receptor I want you to know is a uh, ion channel, a ligand-gated ion channel. Oh, and while I'm thinking about it, I know there's a couple mastering bio questions that, that talk about receptor tyrosine kinase. You don't need to know that. They used to have you know, they used to have that in like the bigger Campbell biology book. You don't need to know, you don't need to worry about that one. Um, but anyways, the ligand-gated ion channel, this is really important, especially in uh, nerve cells. So that ligand, maybe that could be a neurotransmitter that would bind to a uh, protein receptor and then it just, you know, it's like a key card or like a key, just it binds, door opens, ions come in. Ligand leaves, door closes. It's really kind of that simple. 
the ligand, like a more technical way you would say, the ligand binds to the channel and you get a protein, ch a change in the conformation. The binding of that ligand would cause chemical changes that would then open up that channel. Okay? And then, again, these arrows here, they're leading off the whole signal transduction pathway. Right? This would be step one, step three. Step two that they're not showing is that whole second messenger phosphorylation cascade um, type system that I think is on the next slide. It's not, but this slide. They're leaving off all of this part here. Okay. All right, another kind of um, um, uh, signaling would be uh, intracellular receptors. So what's going on here is the receptor is not, the protein receptor is not in the cell membrane, it is in the cytoplasm. So know, the diff know, know why we have intracellular receptors versus receptors on the membrane. And why would we? What do we think? Why do we need to have intracellular receptors? What would, what would be the difference here? <coughs> Thomas? Yeah. Polarity. This isn't for use for chemistry, but polarity, right? This is hormones tend to be nonpolar. So this is a nonpolar molecule. So it, it can pass through the cell membrane. Only nonpolar things can get through that yellow um, uh, hydrophobic nonpolar region of the cell membrane. And so that's why you have intracellular receptors. Meaning if I go back, this receptor, this receptors that bind to membrane-bound receptors, those are, are, those are polar molecules, they're hydrophilic. They have to bind to a membrane receptor because they can't go through the cell membrane. Okay. All right, and then uh, what's kind of unique with the uh, intracellular receptors is they're very simple, meaning the molecule that does reception will also do step two, the transduction. So this binds, and then they call it the hormone receptor complex, that will then act as the, uh, the actual signal transduction, and then um, specifically it's acting like a transcription factor. This transcription factor. We'll learn about transcription later on in the year. Transcription is where we, um, transcription factors turn on certain genes to make the protein that you want. Okay. All right, uh, looking more at step two, the, the signal transduction pathway. So we have uh, your signaling molecule binding to your receptor, and that's then going to lead eventually to a phosphorylation cascade. Now, what they're kind of leaving off here, and it's not always present, so sometimes you would have the second messengers, that cyclic AMP or the calcium ions. Not always, but sometimes you have those second messengers. So keep that in mind. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the second messengers here in a minute. But the phosphorylation cascade, what's going on here is that signaling molecule binds to the receptor. It activates this relay molecule, which will turn on your protein kinase. What does it mean for this? Uh, and then this, this protein kinase, kinases, kind, right? Looks like a P, sort of. They're attaching phosphate groups. So kinase 1 will use the, the, the third phosphate from ATP to attach a, a phosphate to a protein kinase 2. Protein kinase 2 phosphorylates another protein. And there can be more, like there could, this, this uh, pathway, usually there's three kinases. They're only showing two for space reasons. This can get longer, and that leads to an active protein, which then gives you your cellular response. That could be turning on genes or turning them off, or it could be like activating certain uh, chemical reactions. And then last thing is protein phosphatase, PPP, protein phosphatase. Taste, taser, you get hit with a taser, the idea of a taser is to, to, to inactivate you, right? So phosphatase is inactivating the protein kinase. Okay, uh, questions about this? Oh, amplification. You're like, why are we, what is the point of this? Amplification. We're trying to, transmission, yes, we're trying to transmit that, that message from here to here, but transmission by amplification. You want to amplify that message. That's what you get out of this whole pathway. Okay, that's why they call it a cascade. It's like a snowball effect. All right, uh, second messengers. So second messengers, they are part of step two, the signal transduction. Uh, these come before, so they come before the phosphorylation cascade. So right here, this point, this is the phosphorylation cascade. 
just so you don't kind of get lost in where we're at. So um, second messengers are very, very common in your G protein coupled receptors that we talked about earlier, where that G protein, because it got left by its uh, receptor protein because of the, that ligand, you know, Mr. Steelio girl came in and G protein's <laughs> gotta come over here. The enzyme in this case is adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase produces cyclic, cyclic for cyclic, AMP. AMP is related to ATP, but it's the M is mono. Okay? This second messenger could also be calcium. Anyways, the second messengers, their purpose is to keep amplifying the signal. So amplific further amplification is the purpose of second messengers. Okay? Good here? Alright. Um, so this brings it all together for you. So, sort of. Here's your growth factor it binds to your receptor. It leads to your phosphorylation cascade. Sometimes you would have second messengers here. Not all the time. Sometimes you have second messengers. Sometimes you would insert second messengers to further amplify the signal. But they would all have the phosphorylation cascade. That then leads to the activation of a transcription factor. This transcription factor, notice how it has that phosphate on it from the kinase that came from the phosphorylation cascade, turns on specific genes that make proteins. Okay. All right, um, then the final topic was homeostasis. So you have uh, regulators and conformers. Regulators, they keep things regular. We are regulators. We keep our body temperature regular. We like to have it at like 98 0.6 or something degrees Fahrenheit, right? No matter our environment, hot or cold outside, we keep our body temperature con uh, constant. Conformers, they conform, right? If it's cold outside, they're cold inside. It's hot outside, they're hot inside, okay? So a lot of your fish can be um, uh, uh, pretty good conformers, you know, like your largemouth bass. They can do some cool like changes in their, their, cell, their cells to be able to adapt to different temperatures. Okay, uh, homeostasis, home. Home should be a steady, stable place, right? So homeostasis, we have certain things like body temperature, blood pH, even like glucose levels that we want to keep at a stable, constant level. We don't want them to fluctuate too much. Okay? And then um, think of homeostasis like a thermostat. Thermostat, if it senses, uh, I don't know the picture of it, it senses it's too, um, it's too cold, it turns on the heater, to bring you back down to that that set temperature, too hot, turn or too hot. Yeah, you turn on the air conditioner. Whatever. I think we get it. All right. Uh, I want you to know the difference between endotherms and ectotherms. So endo, they generate generate heat in dough, right? Endotherms, they get their heat by metabolism. So like cellular respiration, so you get a lot of heat loss in cellular respiration. It's not completely efficient. For us, we utilize that to keep our body temperature up. Ectotherms, they don't heat themselves by metabolism. They have to rely on external sources. So like laying on a rock or something, you know, to like warm themselves up. No, generally the kinds of organisms that are endotherms versus ectotherms. So like birds and mammals would be endotherms. Your invertebrates um, and non-avian reptiles, so not bird reptiles, would be your ectotherms. Okay. Um, so there you go. Endotherms, uh, they can get a stable body temperature because they can like regulate, like, you know, they can shiver their muscles to warm their body or, to, um, uh, you know, sweat if they're too hot. Um, ectotherms, they have to rely on just like behavioral ways to try to mo monitor their temperature. Okay. Really make sure you understand this diagram here. So this is kind of getting into like your basic homeostasis. So for us, we got our body temperature we want to be at. If it's, um, if it's too hot, we have sensors in our hypothalamus. I want you to know that. Hypothalamus will regulate your temperature. Cells in the hypothalamus sense via the blood that we're too hot. We're gonna dilate our blood vessels to release heat. So that's why your veins stand out if you're like working out and you get pretty hot. You also will sweat to release uh, heat and your body temperature drops. If it's too cold outside, hypothalamus senses that and it'll then cause either um, uh, shivering to uh, to like generate more heat, or maybe we'll do um, a little more cellular respiration to get some heat out of that. Um, know that this is this is negative feedback. <laughs> negative feedback 
is what's going to uh, be the main driver of homeostasis, okay? Um, as opposed to positive feedback. To the last slide, positive feedback goes away from homeostasis. Okay, so in positive feedback, um, so like the classic example is like when babies are born, there is a sensor in the cervix that senses like the pressure there. So when a baby, the head of the baby is pushing against the cervix, that will send impulses to the brain, nerve impulses to the brain, telling the brain to release oxytocin. So oxytocin then moves to the bloodstream, cells specifically in the uterus have a receptor that can respond to oxytocin, and that tells the uterus to contract. So the uterus contracts, well then, you know, the snowball is growing because the uterus contracting causes the head of the baby to push more against the cervix, which sends more nerve impulses to the, to the, hypo, uh, no, not the hypothalamus, that's from the last slide. Uh, uh, pituitary gland, I don't really care if you know that. More oxytocin is released, which sends more uterine contractions, and on and on you go, the snowball keeps getting bigger until the baby's born. Then you go back down to homeostasis. Positive feedback is short term. We're not trying to do that like, that's why you're going away from homeostasis. Negative feedback, this is just showing you like a simpler way, the temperature stuff. You're trying to maintain homeostasis. Um, blood clotting is another example of a positive feedback where you're recruiting the platelets and platelets recruit more platelets. Um, also breastfeeding, interestingly, is another example of a positive feedback. Any questions? Okay, that's all I got for you.